So with that, I'd like to get started inviting our first speaker, and uh, that is Ryan Morgan from VMware. Hey, Bruno, how are you? I'm good, Ryan. Welcome to the show. Is this your first time at JDConf? First time at JDConf. Happy to be here. Um, awesome. Great. Awesome. Yes. That question is tricky because this is the second JDConf. It's not like we have 10. So it's kind of like weird asking that question. But <laughs> uh, I'm excited to be here with you because uh, today we're going to talk about um, uh, how VMware uh, has been uh, helping evolve in the Spring community and uh, also how the Java <clears throat> evolution uh, is helping Spring developers and other things that uh, we have uh, put some nice notes behind the scenes to talk about. So uh, why don't we introduce ourselves first and then uh, for people watching, uh, Ryan and I will have this chat for uh, the next 25 minutes and then uh, after that we'll have the first uh, session from uh, Melissa McKay and Brian Benz to talk about uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment with GitHub. So Ryan, please introduce yourself. Great, thank you, Bruno. Yeah, my name is Ryan Morgan. Uh, I run engineering here at VMware for developer ecosystems, which is our investments in uh, the Java ecosystem as well as our .NET investments. Uh, I've been a part of the Spring team since 2009 and have been managing the team uh, since 2016 or so. So I've been, here through the, the transition through Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, as well as all of our uh, our collaboration with Microsoft on, on all the work that we're doing with uh, the, the Spring Cloud starters for Azure. All right, awesome, yeah. Uh, I've been a Spring developer myself uh, before I got into this vendor ecosystem, like let's build technologies for our users. I was a Spring user developer uh, around 2000, between 2005 and 2012, and uh, I did see a lot of changes. Uh, so. Uh, why don't you tell us like this this journey that Spring uh, went through since its inception and where it is today and where it is going? Certainly, uh, yeah. So the you know I've really kind of break down the, the the Spring timeline into maybe three different kind of eras, right? So Spring's been around for this will be our twentieth year. Uh, I would say the first ten years or so was really kind of transformative as we introduced dependency injection and just kind of a new way of, uh, of for developers to to write code. Uh, starting in around 2013 or 14 was really the second generation where Spring Boot became uh, became more popular. Um, you know, folks wanted to run kind of self-contained applications, uh, and that really kind of enabled uh, those applications to be run out on the cloud, right? Uh, from there, you know, we kind of had a, ho a whole host of other problems that we had around coordination of microservices, uh, which uh, we addressed with Spring Cloud. Um, and really now we're kind of entering what is almost the third act, right? So we're seeing more and more, you know, use cases around uh, kind of edge and functions. Uh, there's, you know, things around latency and, uh, you know, kind of density in, in terms of, of, of how you deploy your applications. And we're really kind of addressing that with uh, the upcoming Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3 releases here at the end of the year. So, so Spring, uh, Spring 6 is coming out. And uh, what, I, what I read recently is that the baseline will be Java 17, which is like the latest and greatest LTS release long-term support of Java. So, uh, and, I, and I also saw this new Relic report about Java adoption out there. Um, what are some of the like? What is interesting for Java developers, Spring developers, to be aligned with these modern Java story, and uh, where 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 to catch for Spring Cloud native developers uh, as well when it comes to cloud deployment? Right. Yeah. So we're we're seeing definitely a, a move. Um, you know, Java 11 is is certainly becoming more and more popular. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of of interest in containerizing your applications. Um, you know, we do a, a survey every year called the State of Spring Survey. Uh, in between 2020 and 2021, we saw an increase from 44% of all applications are being containerized up to 57%. So we're seeing more and more of, of, of this kind of trend um, towards containerization, towards, again, concerns around just the, the, the footprint and, and startup times. And really, that's kind of what we're doing here with with uh, Spring Framework six and Spring Boot three, right? So the to go to your original kind of uh, question around Java seventeen is, 
you know, really what we're trying to do here is kind of prepare the, the spring developer for the next 10 years, right? So it's really kind of a, a, a transformational change um, in, in terms of kind of this rebaseline on Java 17, as well as a, a rebase on Jakarta EE. So that's, that's another big change that's coming as part of uh, Spring Framework 6 and, and Spring Boot 3. So yeah, that's, uh, it, it's interesting, like you mentioned Jakarta EE and uh, like the, the, the Java ecosystem, this split between Spring and Jakarta EE, the reality is Spring uh, relies on Jakarta EE APIs a lot. So there is really this collaboration between these two ecosystems. And, and uh, uh, I expect to see Spring developers collaborating with that evolution as well moving forward now with this uh, rebase on Jakarta EE um, <clears throat> new APIs. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, when we had this chat before, we spoke about uh, the best website in the world, it's store.spring.io. And uh, I, wanna, I wanted to hear from you, like, uh, like what are some of the numbers that, that, that you guys see uh, through this, this gateway to the internet of Spring developers? Right, yeah, it's Josh Long's uh, second favorite place on the internet, I believe. Um, I think his, his favorite place is production. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we do get a lot of information, you know, so start.spring.io is, is a way for developers to bootstrap you know, new applications. Um, you know, through that, we get about uh, 1.6 million projects generated per month. Uh, so we do get quite a bit of data on just what the community is doing. And again, kind of going back to the, the Java 11 uh, story earlier, uh, you know, we are seeing, uh, I think, uh, this year was the first time that Java 11 eclipsed Java 8. So, you know, roughly 45% or so of, of new Spring apps are on Java 11, around 40% are on Java 8, and then we're actually seeing a, a, a rapid increase in usage of Java 17, so that's up to 10%. So it's been interesting to kind of see the uptake um, uh, of usage of, of Java 17 already. So it's uh, what I like about these numbers, it's, it's never like 10,000 stuff, a hundred thousand stuff. You're already talking about millions, right? Millions yeah. of downloads, millions of projects created. And uh, that is amazing. And that really shows the size of the Java ecosystem and the Spring ecosystem as well. Uh, last time I checked, there are like more than 10 million Java uh, developers in the world. So I'm sure that translates to roughly, at least 20, oh, not 20, maybe 30 to 40% are Spring developers. Um, uh, I would guess. I would not throw in the lottery, but that was my my wild guess. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned like Josh's favorite place, uh, production. Uh, when developers put applications in production, especially Spring applications, um, how do they keep track of that? I mean, building an application sounds easy. Moving that to production sounds hard but maintaining that application in production sounds even scarier. So <clears throat> what are some of the trends that you see and that VMware sees for, for that part of the journey? Right, so I mean, first off, uh, you know, we do see the, the JAR packaging um, is certainly more popular than more packaging, right? So roughly 95% of all net new Spring apps are using JAR packaging. Um, you know, part of that is to really encapsulate your application and, and to really be able to track the dependencies that are that are being used. Um, Spring Boot does provide a, a fantastic dependency manager uh, in terms of being able to bring in all the dependencies that your application might need. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, we we do see that you know overall applications are getting more and more complicated, right? Uh, the introduction of of clouds. Uh, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. Um, there's there's so many different ways that that folks are deploying applications today. Um, so one other thing that we're doing as a part of the Spring Framework Six and Spring Boot Three releases is really a refocus on observability, right? So we have Micrometer, which is a, a fantastic library that we have for uh, being able to collect and 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 publish metrics to a variety of different systems. I believe that today we support around 19 different backends uh, for Micrometer. Uh, but we're taking that one step further, and uh, with these upcoming release, we'll be folding in uh, distributed tracing as well. So we have a project called Spring Cloud Sleuth, uh, which has been used to uh, to enable that that feature. That's moving directly into Micrometer, and then uh, the entire portfolio is getting kind of a um, 
a direct integration with micrometer. So you're, we're going to have a much better story around observability coming uh, here in uh, these new releases. Okay. So, so with observability, there is, I think there is this interest in, in, in better efficiency, right? You keep monitoring your application in production, you keep seeing how your application evolves, and then you try to identify the points where you want to make it better. And uh, I, I see this trend about going native, going like, not, not necessarily cloud native as Josh preaches for the past two decades, but really like going native in terms of runtime. So what is, what is a, a Spring's roadmap for that? Yes, yeah, so this has been a, a big focus of the team the past uh, almost two years. Um, you know, at Spring One back in uh, late 2021, uh, we announced Spring Native. Uh, at that point, it was 0 0.11, I think that was released. And really what that was is an experiment that we were running uh, around a new AOT framework uh, for Spring. Uh, we had recently now just moved that into the core, uh, you know, Spring projects, and it's going to be a, a focus area for uh, Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. Uh, going forward. So what that gives users is a couple things. So one, it does allow uh, native compilation of uh, your Spring applications down to uh, native executable. So this is a, a really important, uh, I think, use case or a feature um, for, again, those low latency type use cases where you might need to start in a few milliseconds versus the traditional JVM startup time of maybe you know a second or more. So. That's one area where I think there's a, a lot of, of opportunity for us. Um, uh, but uh, the interesting part about all this is that all the work that's going in uh, to enable uh, this native compilation also is going to benefit the traditional you know, Java developer on the JVM, right? So we're seeing you know, increased uh, startup time or decreased startup times, you know, anywhere from like four to, to 20%. But we're also seeing a, re a reduction in RSS memory as well. So, Really, the work that we're doing around native is going to benefit really all users of Spring, whether um, you're on the JVM or you're deciding to compile down to a, to a native binary. So, uh, so if I, uh, I've played with with uh, native uh, runtimes before, and uh, one of one of the most well known projects right now is Graal VM, and uh, uh, the process of getting a, a, an application natively compiled with Graal VM, especially complex applications, is not that simple, right? Um, there are lots of uh, hoops that people have to go through and identify the levers that are using if the levers are even compatible uh, with some of that work. And it's it's good to see that it, it is the Spring team going through that exercise to enable the Spring technologies to do that. So end users and and user developers don't have to do that themselves. Um, but when it, when it comes to like the benefits for the cloud, what are some of the expectations that developers should have when, when they go to, the, to an actual cloud service, uh, let's say they go native or they stick to the JVM, what are some of the expectations of developer experience and what, what, what developers actually want to get from a cloud service? That's a good question. So, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what, what we're doing with, with native, right? So um, certainly it's not going to be the, the uh, a use case for everything. I think that there's, you know, you need to look at the individual, you know, problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, in, in particular, the developer experience around using uh, native executables is, is, is very different, right? So the, the compilation phase takes a lot longer. And there's more of a cycle, I guess, in terms of uh, the iterative uh, development that you're doing when you're working with native. Um, so that's kind of what maybe one big change in terms of what people could expect. Um, you know, but overall, I think that you know, as you said, like the community and, and and the push towards native, there's a lot of work to be done across you know the entire you know Java ecosystem in terms of, of, of being ready for uh, this this kind of large change towards uh, towards going native. Yeah, there's there, there, clearly there are trade-offs, right? That developers have to to choose from. Uh, I like to say I like to say that YAML is one of the best trade-offs in developers' lives because they are trading off trading off all the developer productivity versus finding white spaces on YAML files. So all these advancements in technology are uh, being traded with YAML. So I yeah. think when it comes to native <clears throat> and the JVM hotspot, it's a similar uh, discussion, right? I'm, I'm gaining on this, but I might be losing on this. So that it's important that developers understand uh, what, true, what, what is the true benefit for their particular application, right? Of course, we all want things to go faster, 
but it's also the question whether you want to go faster. Uh, uh, you you want to go faster at the beginning, or you want to go faster in the, on the long run. Um, yeah. So so for cloud applications, we see this trend about deployment on Kubernetes or services where you have this horizontal scaling to uh, support the demand. Um, and uh, I think that for that native is quite interesting. Do you see um, do you see uh, um, this this customer exercise this this developer exercise where should applications scale out, should applications scale up, where are they gaining startup time, tail latency? Where where do, and even like how does VMware deal with that those sort of conversations with customers? Right. So the this is another kind of uh, maybe benefit, right? So the the native story that we have, um, you know, the scale out horizontally is, is certainly something there that where you can, you know, really rapidly, uh, you know, create new instances to to handle new new traffic. Um, and maybe going back to your your previous comment, just around you know, all these trade-offs that people have to go through. Um, you know, that's one of the areas where, you know, we do try to reduce the toil for developers. Um, you know, we are big believers in build packs. Uh, in fact, I believe in uh, Spring Boot 2.3, we introduced the build pack support directly into the Maven and Gradle kind of life cycle. So you can actually be creating your containers, you know, directly from your command line. And then uh, also taking advantage of all the other kinds of, of deployment options that we might have. So there's a there's a build pack for doing native images. Uh, there's ones that um, are experimental that will layer application code in different uh, layers in your container from maybe the dependencies. And that allows you to do things like upgrade uh, you know your version of, of Java or upgrade dependencies without really needing to repush your application code. So there's a lot of things here that the that the, the Spring team kind of thinks through and, and tries to kind of reduce that toil for developers. Um, and that's really kind of what we try to do here at VMware is just make it as easy as possible um, to get your code from the laptop to, you know, to production. Right, yeah. I did I did play with a, a Spring, Tool, Spring Tool Suite, I think. That, is that called? The yep. extension for Eclipse? Yeah. Yep, Spring Tools, yeah. And I think uh, even like on, on uh, IDEs are more like the Maven focus, perhaps. Um, uh, the Azure Studio Code relies a lot on Maven and uh, just the raw build elements. And I think there are even like things for a spring there that allows developers to have this more uh, like faster development cycle where they can just make changes and experiment with things. So it's, it's nice to see that. Um, so uh, the last thing I think I'd like to touch with you is Azure Spring Cloud. I mean, it's it was a service announced, uh, I think, two years ago uh, right. or more, right? I think three years ago. And uh, I wanted to hear, like, what what are the impressions so far? We, it's, it's, it's been GA for a while. Customers are using, developers are in love with the idea of having a managed service for Java applications and Spring applications. What are some of the benefits and what is the roadmap looking like? Yeah, so this has been a collaboration between Microsoft and VMware that's been going on for a while. Um, like all great collaborations, it started out in open source. So you know, back at, uh, I believe, spring one, maybe even 2017 or 18, you know, we started talking about how do we get uh, you know, developers on Azure more productive? How, how can we create kind of the starters and, and connectors uh, so that spring developers can consume Azure services in a real seamless way? And really that kind of open source collaboration uh, almost kind of dovetailed more into a uh, more of a commercial uh, partnership between Microsoft um, and VMware. So 2019, we announced the service at Spring One. Uh, this past December, uh, it went into public preview. So anybody can go onto, uh, onto Azure, uh, just search for um, Azure Spring Cloud. It's in public preview. Uh, we will have, uh, more details to share here soon. It's 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 not quite in GA yet. I believe the GA date is, is set for uh, early in June. Uh, but really, we're offering uh, the ability for really any Spring developer to essentially push their code, uh, consume things like service discovery, things like distributed configuration, really all the things you'd expect from Spring Cloud, but really have that be in just a, a managed way. So really, all you need to worry about is your own application code itself. Um, there's a variety of dashboards as well, so you can visualize your applications. Um, so it's, it's really a great option for, for anybody who wants to have kind of that, uh, that self-service kind of hosted experience around Spring. So uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, we didn't talk about this, but I'd like to 
throw in and see how, how you react to this. Uh, <clears throat> so Spring Cloud, uh, very distributed microservice development approach, right? But lots of developers still kind of prefer monolithic applications and just, you know, Spring Framework or Spring Boot, but everything on a single application, the, the UI, the front end, the REST APIs, database connection, what, what is the trend looking like here? Are, are we really going full microservice? Uh, our monolithics will live forever? What, what do you see? I think you need to choose the right tool for the job, right? I mean, obviously, uh, microservices aren't really for everyone. Um, I, I think there is the, uh, you know, must be this tall to ride kind of uh, joke that, that people have around this. So in, you know, in many cases, we have customers that have you know, legacy spring applications that are monoliths that they just lift and shift and they have that be, you know, running in a container somewhere, um, they might take bits and pieces of that. So that maybe they front that with Spring Cloud Gateway. Uh, they they take portions of it off into a microservice that might need to scale or have different scaling characteristics. Um, you know, but overall, I think that we, you know, we see that more for the like the brownfield or like the the, the older applications that are that are maybe not uh, being targeted for you know to, to be modernized. Uh, you know, for a lot of net new applications, I, I, I do see more of a trend towards microservices. And again, that's kind of why we're seeing this kind of, uh, you know, this interest in things like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. It's, it's really around the coordination of all those of all those pieces. Okay. So, so no, we cannot announce yet the death of monolithic applications <laughs> too soon, right? Uh, okay, soon. cool. Excellent. Uh, the... The other thing we, we talked about was um, CICD. And you mentioned this before uh, uh, briefly, like how going native, for example, can impact uh, that process. So uh, where do you see like customer paying, where should customers pay attention to with CICD platforms, their development cycle? And uh, what are some of the interesting services and technologies out there that can help them on that journey to make sure that you know, their, their flow continues uh, uh, their software flow continues without much of an impact, even though they're modernizing with technologies that technically can impact on that. Right. Yeah, I mean, we don't really have a, a, a definitive view on, you know, what CI, CD is best. Um, you know, within the Spring team, we use a tool called Concourse. Um, it's something that's been in use by the, the, the Cloud Foundry community as well. And it's really a, a great way to... Um, you know, be able to visualize your, your pipelines. Uh, we used to have screens here. Back when we were in the office, there'd be screens here everywhere it's kind of showing you the status of, of various pipelines. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the DevOps kind of workflows, um, you know, we are starting to do more around kind of automatic publishing of, of artifacts, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, pushing to Artifactory using their, their CLI plugin. Uh, this, that's happening today in, in, in Spring Cloud Dataflow. Um, and you know we're looking to do more and more of that across the portfolio as well. Okay, awesome. Um, the, we we are looking at we are talking about the calendar of conferences. And conferences are starting to get back. We couldn't do JDConf uh, on site, uh, uh, but conferences are coming back. I mean, this week is JFocus happening in Sweden, and lots of Java community folks are there speaking and presenting. Um, what are some of the places that Spring developers should pay attention to to go and watch and learn more about? The things that you you described here, like Spring Framework Six and the future roadmap of, of Spring uh, technologies. Certainly, yeah. There's 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 no shortage of of conferences you can go to. Um, uh, Spring I/O Barcelona is coming up here at the end of May. Uh, that's always been a, a a great conference, especially for those folks that are in Europe that can that can get there. Uh, we also have Spring One Tour, which is a kind of a mini series of of Spring One that happens throughout uh, North America. Um, you can go to Spring One Tour, or you can just Google Spring One Tour to kind of find the dates. But we're looking at uh, Toronto, New York, Seattle, Atlanta, and then Amsterdam um, towards the end of the year. And then uh, we are back in person this year for Spring One. So Spring One will be here in San Francisco at Moscone Center. And I believe that's December 6th to the 8th. So uh, keep your calendars uh, marked for that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to book my travel right away. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I really want to go back to San Francisco. It's been a while. Um, awesome. Um, um, Ryan, any any last message you want to give to folks watching or Spring developers? Like, what what excites you and VMware, and where do you want to see Spring developers at in the near future? 
Yeah, I mean, there's never been a better time, I think, to be a Java developer. Um, it's been you know, really interesting here over the past couple of years to see you know, Amazon with, with Coretto, you have Microsoft and all the work that, that you've been doing around uh, Adoptium and the, you know, and the Eclipse Foundation. So really, there's, there's no shortage of, of options for developers out there. Uh, we're also seeing just a, a, an increase in, in overall Java developers across the world. So, um, you know, it's never been easier to write Java code. It's never been easier to deploy it. Uh, again, Azure Spring Cloud, things like that enable you to, to really get from, you know, code to production very, very quickly. So it's, it's a very bright future, I think, for, for our, you know, everybody on the JVM. And uh, again, I'm really happy to, to be here talking with you about it. Awesome. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, uh, stick with us actually for a little bit. We're going to introduce the next speaker, but I want to wrap up this call. So uh, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Bruno.